In 1920, British archaeologist Stanley Casson wrote in the Classical Review about a mythical people called the Hyperboreans. According to Greek mythology, Hyperborea is the northernmost part of the known world. Ancients from Herodotus to the poet Pindar wrote of the Hyperboreans, a divinely blessed people inhabiting an ancient utopia. Friedrich Nietzsche used Hyperboreans as a term of endearment for his audience in the Antichrist, the term referring to a people, or in Nietzsche's case, his audience, who were exceptional, different from the norm. In the classical review, Casson wrote the following. The process in general thus seems to have been one of the gradual Hellenization of a non-Hellenic group of stories, and not, as has been suggested, the reverse. The Hyperboreans, as a nucleus of myths and travellers' tales, belong essentially to the far east of antiquity. The griffins, which are so closely associated with them, belong to Asia, while the celestial still calm, which characterizes the utopian conditions of the land of the Hyperboreans, may well be some faint echo from civilized China, which reached the informants of Abarus and Aristeas, and was reproduced by Hellenicus in the formulae current in early Greek ethnology. The legends of the Hyperboreans undoubtedly reached Greece from the east in the first part of the 6th century BC at the latest. The false etymology, which caused Herodotus to create his Hyperboreans, may have arisen later, and the original name may have been a genuine tribal name in its original form. In short, Casson claimed that the Hyperboreans actually had their roots in non-Hellenic peoples, namely in Chinese civilization. And his claim, made over a hundred years ago, has made its way into 21st century Gen Z's lexicon and culture. This claim resonates with Gen Z audiences trying to find an identity for themselves in our globalized virtual world. And these are a whole mixture of people, from RCTAs to ECTAs, to individuals that follow a modern pseudo-philosophy called angelicism, to your everyday K-pop and J-pop stan. But what all these seemingly disparate people have in common is their desire to escape. This overwhelming desire to escape either a modern world that they perceive as being hostile to them or that they simply have no hope or faith in. There is an ideal, a perfect mythical existence embodied by all of these groups who believe themselves to be outsiders in this world. So let's get into it. Over the past five years, racial subliminal creators have emerged on YouTube and TikTok. On TikTok, they are overwhelmingly young East Asian American teenage girls and young women, as well as white women and teenage girls who are looking for individuals like them. That is, young people who feel more connected to an Asian identity, people and culture. However, it is important to note throughout this video that their perception of East Asia is incredibly specific and very much a product as opposed to a reality. There is a distinction between these two groups of teenage girls and young women. RCTA stands for race change to another and typically refers to Caucasian individuals who choose to change their racial categorization to one that is East Asian. ECTA stands for ethnicity changed to another and typically refers to an East Asian individual choosing to change their racial categorization to another East Asian racial categorization. If somebody who is East Asian, say Japanese, relates more and feels greater kinship to somebody who is of another East Asian ethnicity, say Korean, specifically South Korean, they can therefore identify as South Korean. Now, ECTA went viral in mid-2022 and has accumulated over 5.8 million searches on TikTok. What is important to note and what I gathered is that RCTAs and ECTAs do not see themselves as transracial. Transracialism refers to individuals who relate more to a different race as opposed to the one that they have been bestowed with from birth. And because transracialism typically means people altering their appearance. 
through cosmetic procedures, plastic surgery, etc., through mere clothing, just cultural immersion, they are seen by RCTAs and ECTAs as beneath them. And this is because, as far as I can gather, transracialism doesn't factor in one crucial step in the transformation that RCTAs and ECTAs find to be the most paramount and most important thing of changing your race. That is, transracials don't actually become another race. Sure, they can get cosmetic surgery and learn the language, but that's all surface level stuff. What RCTAs and ECTAs do is incorporate subliminal stimuli into their racial rebirth. Hence the rise of racial subliminal creators who offer hopefuls a truly magical way of in fact truly becoming East Asian and therefore becoming a true transracial. By listening to and watching these videos, you can in fact, over time and with patience and perseverance, become what you desire. Listen and watch a visual stimuli in order to get the facial features of Jenny Kim, a K-pop star, or Jisoo's facial features, or better yet, a perfect slim thick body. Powerful. And of course don't forget to follow these instructions. Drink shit ton of water but don't choke please. Keep the volume at 200 to 500. Headphones highly recommended. Downloadable. Wave recommended for clearer AFFS. Have faith and patience. Relax. Don't give up easily. You'll surely achieve results. Everyone gets different times for results. Of course, that's important to note because when you're 80 and your eyes start to droop, that's obviously the jisoo kicking in. Racial subliminal methods aren't just incorporated and obsessed over by YouTubers and TikTokers, however. This trend has made its way onto Twitter and resonates with Chinese Twitter users and their virtual friends. Although Twitter is banned in China, it is estimated, at least as of 2016, that at least 10 million Chinese natives have access to and stay active on Twitter. That is, China has more more active Twitter users than France. And racial subliminal content seems to be causing waves among particular groups of users. The Amerimut fears the Chinese Aryan. It's an example of everything that they are lacking in. The pure quirked up vibe that is coming off of just one picture is enough to send them into shock. They cannot comprehend what it's like to be a transracial princess and I pity them. Chinese girls are the descendants of the Hyperboreans. That is why why we are superior. We have the true Aryan spirit inside of us and have leveled up our looks so much that we're 3,000 years ahead in fashion and makeup. Chinese e-girls are doing things white women can't even imagine. Due to being a neat, that is, not in employment or education, for most of my life, my skin has not seen the sun in years. This is how I achieved a beautiful pale complexion akin to a Victorian girl. Westerners have been hating in the replies because of jealousy. Every girl in China wants to look like me. If you are a girl, you should not work like a princess. It is only right. Your skin should be silky smooth and pale as snow. This is why you find a good man early. I'm still proud of my beautiful skin. The haters need to let love and God into their life. You might not agree with what I find to be beautiful, but that doesn't mean you get to bully or belittle me for it. Remember, I love you. What I learned today is to never take the advice of measly peasants. They are... <laughs> <clears throat> what I learned today is to never take the advice of measly peasants. They are unworthy of my attention. After all, they are so bad at hiding their jealousy that it's laughable. I'll keep being a beautiful princess while you cry in my replies. Thank you for the engagement. The negative replies are not surprising to me. It's a well-known fact that China is 3,000 years ahead of the West. Your people used to be warriors, but now the modern American man complains about an innocent Chinese girl's fashion choices. You do not know the touch of a woman. In China, we wear special face masks to keep our skin pure white. Just do this, plus sunblock. Women shouldn't work. What kind of sick society would force it? If you're a man, you need to make enough money so that your woman doesn't have to work. Only poor people disagree. Women are meant to play games and paint watercolor all day. Demanding anything else is sexist. Become a Chinese woman. Powerful, subliminal. This is what the average Chinese woman in Shanghai looks like nowadays. It's beautiful. Tell me again, transracialism isn't real? This is 
why the West is failing while China is booming. This is what the average woman looks like in Hyperborea and it's beautiful. Hyperborean genetics. Shanghai 2023 versus Detroit 2023. Your enemy is in China. It's the elites at the head of the major corporations taking everything from you. Now what you may have noticed with these examples is not a preoccupation with convincing an audience that Chinese men and women are superior to Western men and women, but an emphasis that Chinese men and women are in fact whiter than Caucasian men and women. And therefore, in being whiter than Westerners, in being whiter than Caucasians, Chinese men and women are the true Hyperboreans and are superior. On these accounts, China is compared incessantly to the US, not just in reality, but in its potential for the future when it comes to our digital reality. Take for instance these tweets from Charlotte Fang, an individual who I'll come back to momentarily. We warned you about the reverse Asian fish. China is about to make everything real. In China, everything is infinite. So why am I talking about RCTAs and ECTAs in relation to Hyperborea and Hyperboreans? Well, I believe them to be connected, intimately connected, because they both believe themselves to be exempt from a lot of modern day conversations, moral standards, and expectations. These racial subliminal devotees and Hyperboreans believe that they will live longer than Westerners. Westerners who will die sooner due to poor living conditions. They have learned how to subdue negativity and to only bring and manifest positivity into their lives to such an extent that they don't even care about everyday things like their 20 years worth of mounting debt. What racial subliminal devotees and Hyperboreans have in common is an emphasis on their truth over the truth. Your truth and existential purpose are far more important than questions of cultural appropriation, irrationality and basic sense. The real world is not a world to be in when our wired, interconnected world is so ever-present. Elisa is a 15-year-old Ukrainian turned Japanese girl and she had the following to say to NBC News. We only live once, so I think we should do everything we want to do in life, even if others think it's not okay or you can't achieve it. Now, I don't think this can be so easily dismissed as children being victims of hyper-individualism. Yes, I think this is definitely a part of it, but I do think we inevitably all live in an individualistic zeitgeist in which we all channel our individualism into things that are, for the vast majority of people, far more socially acceptable means of being individualistic and egotistical, such as being basic consumers of things. I think this has more to do with something I noticed when looking into this community of fascinating, faceless people who all seem to have a hell of a lot to say about the world in which we live and their place in it. There was something about their profiles, their profile pictures, and their repetitive references which seemed quite odd. What stood out to me was their use of words and phrases such as "milady" and I love you. So of course I had to look into it. Hi, I'm Hyperstition. I defaulted on all my student loans and rotated profits into circumnavigating the globe to research the Hyperborean race. I'm a 19 year old freelance quant dev with a plus three standard deviation IQ and I love life. I'm married to based retard gang. Based retard gang forever. It is my spiritual network. BRG is sublime. I'm overcome by the instrumentality of the movement. Swept up like water flowing in a river. BRG is love. BRG forever. BRG will set you free. Before I try to explain what hashtag BRG is or what it tries to present itself as, namely a pseudo philosophy that is very contradictory, which is the point. I'd just like to go through the main characteristics of what it is to be hashtag BRG. BRG is described by Know Your Meme as quote an Instagram and TikTok page that posts videos using eagle symbolism to make girl boss adjacent affirmation content. Additionally the social media page's name combines the slang term based and the controversial term retard. One noticeable characteristic of people who claim to be a part of BRG is their emphasis on BRG 
being NEET or N-E-E-T, which stands for Not in Employment or Education or Training. This lifestyle is purportedly desired by BRGs. Some of them make reference to Terry Davis, the late programmer and designer of Temple OS. Like BRGs, Davis used slurs in his online streams of consciousness, which he posted during his final years of homelessness and unmedicated schizophrenic episodes. The late Terry Davis is a good example, I think unintentional example, of what many in BRGs ERG try to present themselves as, namely geniuses that are misunderstood by the world and who are sort of aware of the matrix, but at the same time are aware that the matrix is the matrix and are above it and above everything. They know what is going on in the world when nobody else does. According to one BRG, BRG is involved in harnessing the power of collective consciousness, understanding the fluid nature of reality and leveraging the interconnectedness of all things to bring about a massive positive shift or enlightenment in the world. BRG is essentially a stem off of a bigger concept and idea, which we can call network spirituality. Network spirituality is intimately connected to our racial subliminal devotees and hyperboreans. The term network spirituality was coined by artist FODCOM and is associated with Romilia Corporation and their infamous digital art show, I Long for Network Spirituality. In this network spirituality, you can be transracial because the hyperreality of virtual networks is more real than the real world itself. Racial subliminals, BRGs and hyperboreans believe that this hyperreality of virtual networks is more real than the real world around them. And it isn't necessarily that that they believe this to be the case right now in the present. They believe that this is where we are going and therefore they are living like the future, like the inevitable future. Twitter Mischief Very Special tweeted, Milady is as close as you can get to open carrying online. And this is a perfect metaphor for everything that I said in this video. Based Retail Gang and Milady are perfect contemporary examples of what it means to be clear pilled. There's a lot of pills on the internet at the moment. But basically, when it comes to the modern world that we live in today, one conceptually has to take a pill by virtue of being a modern citizen. The majority of us are accused of taking what is called the blue pill. When we're faced with life's harsh realities, we choose to remain in blissful ignorance. Actually, let's use a very simple, mediocre example in order to show what each pill signifies. Imagine there's two best girlfriends, one black, one white. Objectively speaking, the black girlfriend is prettier than her white girlfriend. However, all the guys in college, when asked who they find more attractive, pick the white girlfriend because she's not their type. A blue pilled response to this example of racial preferencing in modern dating would be one of blissful ignorance. The typical, she's not my type, will suffice, and we go on with our lives. A red pilled response to this example can basically be summed up as a preference for the truth. You want exposure to what you perceive as the under underlying realities of the world and situations like she's not my type. A red pilled response would therefore be that the black girlfriend is not my type because she's black. And the reality is that in modern societies, black skin is deemed less attractive irrespective of whether it's on a prettier woman. A black pilled response would be the more extreme red pill to swallow. Whereas the red pill would offer the black girlfriend some hope in her situation. For instance, maybe she should invest in skin lightening products or 
will immigrate back to Africa, where she'll definitely be considered the most attractive woman on the whole continent, am I right? The Black Pill sees no hope. Ultimately, the Black girlfriend, no matter what she does, will still be Black, even if she lightens her skin, even if she moves back to Africa. Her only true option is to just give up and accept her fate. There's no hope nor escape from the fact that she's Black, and therefore the most undesirable demographic when it comes to physical attractiveness based on global standards, both historically and presently. So we've characterized what a blue pill, a red pill, and a black pill response would be. So what would a clear-pilled response be? Clear-pilled is referenced constantly by BRG and is crucial to the whole movement. Now, if we compare the black pill to the clear pill, if we think of the hopeless nihilism at the root of the black pill, what it leads to is an ensuing and inevitable depression. A depression that inevitably emerges from realizing that there is no hope or meaning. Basically, to be black-pilled is to be depressed. The clear pill, however, does a complete 180 when it comes to responding to the insanity of reality. Clear pillars like Biagia's not only embrace the chaos and precarity of the modern age, they revel in it, but they go even further. Because to be clear-pilled is to will the cataclysmic downfall of our modern world order. And that includes includes the downfall of our modern norms, our modern mores, standards, and way of life. And the sooner this happens, the better. Capitalism has begun to constrain the productive forces of technology. Our version of accelerationism is the basic belief that these capacities can and should be let loose, repurposed toward common ends, toward an alternative modernity. Network spiritualists like Biagias have a very clear objective when it comes to their shitposting and virtual movement. It isn't that they have to prove normies like you or me wrong. Their objective is to play us like puppets in our own self-destruction and chaos. Because posts like these have a ripple effect. Normies are outraged and fight among each other about these posts, distracted from dealing with the real issues of the world and thus contributing to their own demise. When posts like these garner engagement, when people agree with them, when people bicker about them. Unavoidably, normie and blue-pilled standards and morals and expectations about how the world works are questioned. Our entire systems, including that of race, is shook to the core. From debt to home ownership, to having a family, to being able to distinguish between what is universally good and bad is completely obliterated. The downfall of our already precarious modern world is accelerated through the power of technology and virtual networks. Accelerationism has many varieties, but one popular version is the idea that the only way to overcome our current societal breakdown is through a devastating calamity on the order of the nuclear bombs in World War II or the US Civil War. These accelerationists don't just accept the inevitability of such a calamity, but push to bring it about more rapidly so that we can exit to the tech utopia on the other side. Other accelerationists focus less on exit via calamity and instead see tech advancement as messianic. I would argue that BRG is a combination of the two. And what is the future utopia? For the based retard gang, utopia is a glimmering cyberpunk Chinese megacity that is 3,000 years ahead of the West. In this utopia, whiter than white Chinese and East Asian eagles are the embodiment of perfection, advancement, and the future. And so, this is who they rarely are, accelerating themselves into an idealized tech utopia that hasn't even come about. You have to live your truth, fam. And it is this kind of performative transgression that is necessary in realizing network spirituality. Transgressing the boundaries of race are integral to this realization. There is a performative art in being a whiter than white Chinese slash East Asian eagle.
Network spirituality is sort of the pop cultural equivalent to accelerationism. It is an extreme and contrarian attempt to escape doomerism and a world of existential despair. Now, I remember my reference to Charlotte Fang. Well, Charlotte Fang is a network spiritualist. Charlotte Fang is a pseudonym. And Charlotte Fang is also one of the co-founders of Romilia Corporation. Charlotte describes network spirituality as, quote, the shedding of meat space ego and the adoption of a wired persona that's plugged into a network hive. But the entire point of network spirituality and of hashtag BRG is that it's impossible to define. If you need to ask, then clearly you don't get it. Now, all of these characters, all of these seemingly disparate and different characters come together in Romilia Corporation. And in my opinion, whether they know it or not, they are associated with Romilia and its philosophy. Romilia Corporation is described as quote, the anti-woke, decentralized, autonomous organization behind the doomed Milady Maker NFT. It is named after Romilia Scarlet, a Japanese video game character from Taohao Project. As I said, this is a whole deep, dark, and contrarian story and philosophy at the root of everything believed by RCTAs, ECTAs, Hyperboreans, BRGers, network spiritualists within this particular sphere of things. If we go to Romilia's website, we are taken back to something of the retro rebirth of the internet. This is because Romilia represents a type of rebirth of the real, an alternative reality with a deeper meaning. They are the epitome of anti-conformism, of young people who have transformed their loss of hope into a revolutionary new art. Nostalgic symbolism and retro cringe combine to create a new digital art in the form of NFTs or non-fungible tokens shitposting, and a fixation on young e-girls because, quote, young girls are fluid enough to get it. The Milady Maker is an NFT collection of 10,000 neotenous, doe-eyed East Asian avatars that was making absolute bank back in 2022. It was created by Romilia's founders and top dogs, who essentially all congregate in Twitter groups under anonymous profiles. No faces, no real names. Milady is described by its now disgraced founders Charlotte Fang as, quote, a radical dissident art and is what BRG Twitter profiles are referring to when they post Milady every couple of hours. What I find fascinating about these people is that it is very likely that none of them have any association, direct or indirect association, with East Asia or specifically with China, yet they have created and fabricated identities online that they perceive as more real, more integral than who they actually are as meat, flesh and bones. In one way or another, they all subscribe to this pseudo philosophy called angelicism. I won't get into the nitty gritty of the downfall of the founder of Romilia and digital artist Charlotte Fang. That is an entire story, an entire law in and of itself, which doesn't pertain directly to what I am trying to get at here. So I won't go into it, but if you are interested, there are articles galore on the internet. Ultimately, NFT creator who was exposed as being or posting racist, terrible, controversial opinions and content on trolling accounts and investors stopped investing and lo and behold, the fall of the NFT. But one of the main contributing factors to Charlotte Fang's fall was her endorsement of and use of information and use of a particular Substack account. That is Angelicism 01 and the philosophy or pseudo philosophy more so of angelicism. Angelicism is perhaps a perfect example of network spirituality. It is described by its founder as being a philosophy for the 21st century. In my opinion, it is a rather pretentious attempt to garner meaning from the nothingness, the emptiness and the voidness of modern life. However, what angelicism tries to do is to garner 
inner meaning counterculturally. It is possible, according to Angelicism, to find meaning in the absurdity and degeneracy of the modern world and the internet. Network spiritualists aren't just shit posting for the sake of. This shit posting is artistic expression and rebellion. And this, according to them, has a deeper, hyper real meaning and significance. There is a kind of beauty and inexplainable perfection in how temporary and limited limited everything is, from extinction, decay, and the feeling of everything crumbling and ending around us. And the ultimate manifestation of this, according to network spirituality and angelicism, can be found in the example of the young East Asian girl. Whereas quote-unquote normie culture and the mainstream sexualize and objectify the East Asian girl, angelicism finds meaning in her from a different artistic point of view. Such beauty and youth is the epitome of finitude, of short-termism, that everything will not last. The neoteny of stereotypical East Asian girls, teens, and young women symbolizes, quote, youth and scarcity, unable to graduate to the next stage of development. As Angelicism 01 said, young girls are fluid enough to get it. The entire franchise of NFTs is a good example of this. Because the world of NFTs is already so mysterious and ironic, it adds to this aura of us being in in a matrix, a world of secret societies, information and disinformation, as well as a world of understanding that only the few are privy to. There are people puppeteering and pulling the strings all around you. Being a part of this network spirituality gives young people a sense of fighting back in a way that only they know how. They are fighting back in a way that the mainstream and the woke aren't privy to, and importantly, in a way that they are not literate in. Last week on Twitter, a post went viral, which can basically be summed up as a McDonald's is healthy discourse. Interestingly, the original poster is a network spiritualist, or at least has connections within this sphere. The McDonald's is healthy discourse is a good example of this crypto avant-garde and its desire to be blatantly and unambiguously countercultural, disconnected from reality, to be anti-science and anti anti-political correctness. Nonsensical meme replies are deemed the ultimate way of taking down the machine. These kinds of posts and memes obliterate our modern obsession with sources, with academia, with evidence. The mainstream media is no longer an authority of information and knowledge. In fact, memes and being completely irrational shit posters and schizo posters is the true genius. And this, my friends, takes us full circle back to Hyperborea, all the way back to post such as these. The very point of these endeavors, of this hyper-affirmative posting, of the use of slurs, derogatory language, and nonsense, is a sense of power it gives. It denotes genius. The pointlessness is the point. China's youth have lost hope, and it shows, and it's getting worse. In China's modern political climate, there is really no hope for young Chinese folks. Although they are working, they are not being rewarded sufficiently for it. Yet, they are being told that they simply have to keep working, and nobody cares about their complaints. Nobody cares that they can't support their families, that they can't support or finance having a family, buying a home, and being China's most educated generation. Inevitably, disenchantment is going to skyrocket. Many Western societies today are microcosms of China, at least insofar as feeling and sentiment toward the modern world goes. This all boils down to a deep-rooted desire to escape reality. Whether it wants to admit it or not, the entire aesthetic around RCTA, ECTA, BRG, and network spirituality feeds on 
on this dissatisfaction that many young people and very impressionable children, mind you, are feeling or see in landscapes such as contemporary China. It's important to note that these accounts and these individuals may be Chinese, but oftentimes they aren't living in China. In fact, based on my research, a lot of their roots can be found in New York City's Gen Z art scene, in which, and I quote, should posting leftism, crypto, fascist occultism, and cyber libertarianism all congeal together into an amorphous and nihilistic cultural blob. These Gen Zers are unconventionally employed, if they are employed at all. They are art school dropouts like Charlotte Fang, who yearn for a world that is of their own craftsmanship and making. There is so much hope in escaping reality, specifically a reality which seems as inescapable as that of contemporary China or some parts of the modern West. I believe that many young Chinese, like many young Westerners, have since childhood been promised a world which they are suddenly realizing is not in fact theirs. Politicians and adults have largely given up on trying to understand our qualms, our dilemmas, and our specifically modern issues. Issues that are immense, that are very particular to our generation, and that are the root cause of much of our despair and disappointment. Hyperboreans are a perfect manifestation of a world turning on itself in order to escape itself. Nobody uses or makes reference to their real identity on Twitter or in these group chats. Nobody knows who anybody is because it's all virtual in a twisted attempt to make the virtual more real than reality. It is a peculiar attempt at executing their real selves in pursuit of a higher self that has echoes of transhumanism in it. Subliminal messaging is believed to be the new ketamine for young, impressionable youths and serially online folks who feel chewed up and spat out by the modern world. In this virtual world, you are transracial. You aren't just an expression of your fantastical world and digital portfolio. You are that because your digital footprints are transcendental. Your shitposting is actually fostering a collective consciousness online that will give rise to a beautiful and new world, to a post-human world, to a hyperborea full of hyperboreans. Just like Charlotte Fang, you can reincarnate yourself after failing at this life. You can be entirely born again. Even though you may age in the real world, you will not age online. You are timeless. You are a success. You are wealthy. You are not a peasant. And I guess in that, there's hope in our increasingly hopeless world. Do let me know what you think about this community or this online world of individuals who are attempting to become a new kind of East Asian. An East Asian that is whiter than whites. This community of network spiritualists and BRGers. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see all of you very soon in the next one.